and we're having to pick and choose the content that's going to meet our time frame. And think about it. Our time frame is like an hour in change without commercial break. And still the news that's being sent to us, we can't get to. And we're doing long form content, no commercial break, and deep dives. There goes Sam Sanders, the city manager of uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, walking by. We need to get Sam. Judah, let's make a note. Sam Sanders, city manager on the I Love Seville show. I see him all the time. Let's get Sam, Mr. Sanders, on the program to talk about uh, all things Charlottesville on the show and introduce you to Sam. All right, headlines on screen. Take a look. Meg Bryce and Allison Spillman, a Q&A tonight in Crozet. How will the community respond to this q and I'm going to straight up say that this is the most contentious, anticipated, watched, and followed school board election in Almoral County history. I would challenge you, the viewer and listener, to come up with a school board race that's more Beef oriented. Which one has more drama than this one that you can remember? I can't think of a single one. Which one has been more anticipated than this one? I can't think of a single one. Which one has been more watched and followed than this one? I can't think of a single one. You literally at the school board level have people graffitiing Bryce's signs. Like vandalizing school board election signage. Think about that. We'll have a conversation, Judah Wickhauer and I, about that. I also want to highlight 1215 Cherry Avenue. We like to spotlight a piece of real estate once or twice a week. Heather Walker, if you're watching this program, I saw this on your Facebook page. Heather Walker, you have great content, Heather Walker. Johnson Village's finest, Heather Walker. She talked about 1215 Cherry Avenue. It's a two-bedroom, one-bath, 1,037-square-foot home. $385,000 $385,000 pending for a home on a post stamp of a lot on Cherry Avenue, like literally Cherry Avenue, two bedrooms and one bath. Jim Duncan took this piece of uh, real estate under contract. It's pending right now. 1215 Cherry Avenue. Judah's going to show photos here as the show matures. Make sure you have a two shot and your mic ready to go there, J-Dubs. If you're looking at a starter home in Charlottesville City, it's three fifty dollars to $400,000. That's the starter home price. Another business listing on the market. This one, Millie Joe Coffee Shop. Millie Joe Coffee Shop for sale for $150,000 asking price. If you're interested in the financials, touring the business, maybe purchasing the business, Millie Joe is right there uh, where Preston Avenue meets the downtown mall. A hop, skip, and a jump from Staples, the uh, office supply store. $150,000 asking price. If you're interested in this business for a purchase, reach out to me. We're we're your source for anything um, business transaction related. I love Seville and what we're doing here. We'll give you some more insight into the venture fund. I've kind of teased this last week. It's materializing and ironing out. You know, the idea has been percolating for, I don't know, we've been self-employed for 15 and a half years. Of those 15 and a half years, I've been bringing businesses to market with our network of CPAs, attorneys, architects, high net worth individuals, our branding and advertising expertise. In some cases, renting office space to them in our building or connecting these businesses with commercial space with our our network of landlords and business owners. Utilizing our influence with making sure the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. uh, With bringing, bringing the business to market with zoning. I mean, good God, I've been doing this for most of the 15 years. Just time to button it up. We'll make a special announcement with that this week. The name of the fund, where you can find the fund. I've been incredibly um, 
positively, I've been very pleased with the positive response for those looking to nearly two dozen families or individuals looking to contribute to the fund, to capitalize the fund. I've been very impressed with the supply chain of architects and attorneys and accountants and financial managers, engineers and contractors and remodelers looking to do the hammer and the nails and the creation of the businesses as we bring them to market. My firm, my branding and advertising firm is going to do the branding and advertising for these businesses. They need office space to get off the ground. We can provide executive space in the Macklin building. And if they need a commercial space, I mean, I don't think there's anyone locally, maybe me and you know, Johnny Pritzloff. Pritzloff is extremely well connected. Is Pritzloff watching? JP, you watching the program? You do a damn good job, Johnny. I'd say it's probably me and Johnny Pritzloff um, that know the most, you know, commercial and real estate owners in this 300,000 person market. I mean, you know, taking ideas that may be a square and fitting them in a round hole, there's only a couple of people that can do stuff like that locally. He's one, I'm one. We'll talk about that as the week matures. We'll name the fund. We'll talk UVA football in a matter of moments. I do want to start with September 11th. 22-year anniversary of 9-11. I'm going to recount where I was on 9-11. I was a second year at the University of Virginia during 9-11. Um, and during my second year, I lived at Lambeth Commons. Lambeth Commons is the, the housing that UVA Grounds owns. Kind of across from where old U-Hall, University Hall was, and where, kind of across where John Paul Jones Arena is, where um, Panic Garden Buffet, is Panic Garden Buffet still there, Judah, on, on Emmett Street? I drive by it all the time. I do not. I think it's closed. Emmett Street, Panagarden Buffet. Used to be uh, Carmelo's was there, the Italian restaurant, I believe. I believe it's a kebab shop. That's Lambeth Commons is behind that kebab shop. So I'm a 20-year-old. No, heck. 19. Yeah, I was 20-year-old. I'm a 20-year-old in Lambeth Commons, 406-4 Lambeth, the address. Me, my buddy Dave, Connecticut Dave, Tom, Shannon, Rob, the Dirty German, that was his nickname, the Dirty German, and uh, Lee. Lee was our, our sixth and very unique roommate. Three bedrooms, each of us had one roommate, Shannon and I, who lived in Dabney 101. We shared a room as well on, on, in 406-4, room A in Lambeth, Shannon and I. Connecticut Dave and, and Tall Tom, a.k.a. Bean, lived in one room together. The Dirty German and Lucky Lee lived in another room. We had a foosball table there. We partied hard, dude. We drank a boatload of natural light cases of Natty Light. We could get cases of Natty Light from the Harris Teeter for $5.99 a case. And we'd take the, the side of the natural light container, suitcase is what we would call it, the big portion, it's a rectangle, right? The case, the 24 pack. And we'd take the big portion with the Natty Light branding, there's two big portions on it, and we'd cut it out. So we had two rectangles with natural light branding on it per every $5.99, $5.99 case of natural light we purchased. And we did this brick kind of motif of natty light cases all throughout our Lambeth apartment. It was the wallpaper. It was like a wallpaper staccatoed in a brick format like you would see on a brick wall. It took us about a semester 
to natty light the entire main room and kitchen of our room. It became so prolific and noticeable from the outside window that we legitimately had other UVA students, not just in Lambeth Commons, but other UVA students on Rugby Road, Sorority Row, within fourth year housing off grounds, and within first year housing on grounds, stopping by our Lambeth apartment to take photos of the natural light apartment, the Natty Light apartment. I'll see if I can find some images of this and show it to you guys. So I'm 20, I'm old for second year, got held back in kindergarten. I was one of those kids that was like right on the cusp of either being the youngest person for his grade, or if I got held back, I'd be the oldest person. So my parents chose in kindergarten to hold me back. I'm, nine, I'm 20 in uh, second year. My buddies are either 19 or 20. We all have fake New Jersey IDs. I've told the story often of how during our first year at Dabney, we purchased laminate paper and a printer and a glossy gold marker and made f fake New Jersey IDs in the dorm room. Those served us extremely well, especially for taking uh, university transit, the UTS bus from Lambeth to Teeter to carry cases of natural light onto the UVA bus into Lambeth under our shoulders. It was a different time and place then. UVA in 20, like 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, I'd say all the way up to the 2008 housing recession was a very different place than it is now. UVA up to that housing recession was extremely party oriented, like this booze fest. I mean, we were right on the cusp of Easter's. We were on the cusp of midsummers being true midsummers. We stayed through summer and through winter break on grounds. That housing recession of 2008 really changed things for parents and students. And it de emphasized the spending nature of going to bars seven days a week on the corner. So we're in 2001 at Lambeth Commons. And we're frankly living it up like UVA lived it up. Playboy magazine called UVA the number one party school in America for back-to-back -back years. A lot of people don't realize that. Playboy magazine named UVA the back-to-back -back party school in the United States of America for back-to-back -back years coincided when we were there. I have with Tom, Tall Tom, aka Bean, a music appreciation class on September 11th. The class started at 9 a.m. Tom and I walk from Lambeth. We cut through our, we go from our apartment at 456-4 we cut behind Lambeth Commons where there's that amphitheater behind Lambeth. We passed the amphitheater where we played Ultimate Frisbee, drank Natty Lights while playing Ultimate Frisbee, got onto Rugby Road. We walked down Rugby Road. And guys, this was before cell phones. At this point in my life, I did not even have a flip phone. I got a flip phone later my second year. This was September 11th of my second year, so it was early in the semester. I did not even have a flip phone. No, none of us really did. I think Tom was the first one to have a cell phone. He, he came from Rhode Island, and we were all like, man, you have a phone? That is cool, man. Like, it was not something we had. We were using, like, the phones in our respective rooms to call our parents or to call our friends to coordinate plans. We were on instant, you know, AIM. Remember AIM, Judah? Not really. You never used AIM? No. AOL Instant Messenger? No. We would use AOL Instant Messenger to coordinate stuff with people. Not phones. So the morning of September 11th, Tom and I are walking to music appreciation class. <coughs> yes, I took a course called music appreciation. I'm walking down Rugby Road with Tom. We go from Rugby Road across the traffic light. We get onto grounds. 
We pass the rotunda. We walk up. We walk up the, to the lawn. Music appreciation was in Cabell Hall. And as we get to Cabell Hall, we see all the students at our music appreciation class. It was either 9 or 9.30 in the morning. And everyone was waiting outside Cabell Hall, old Cabell Hall on the steps, the steps of old Cabell Hall. And Tom and I immediately thought something was weird. We're like, why are all these people waiting on the steps of old Cabell Hall, all our classmates? It's not like we're that late. We weren't exactly on time, but we weren't exactly that late either. Then we see our teacher walk out of music appreciation class, stand on the top of the steps of Old Cabell Hall, and, and mention in about two minutes or less to all the students in music appreciation class, guys, today's class is canceled. Planes crashed into buildings in Manhattan. And we're not really sure what happened. But we know we shouldn't have class today. We had no idea that there were four coordinated suicidal terroristic attacks carried out by Al-Qaeda against the United States. We had no idea that 19 terrorists hijacked four commercial airliners scheduled to travel from New England to, Man to the Mid-Atlantic regions of East Coast uh, into California. We had no idea that hijackers crashed the first two planes into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York City, two of the world's five tallest buildings at the time, and aimed the next two flights toward targets in, in Washington, D.C. in an attack on the nation's capital. We had no idea of any of this stuff. We just knew that planes crashed into buildings in Manhattan. So Tom and I were like, dang. No class. And it didn't really set in. And it didn't set in until we got back to 456-4, our apartment in Lambeth Commons, where the wallpaper was natural light, cardboard cutouts of 24 packs of beer. And then Tom and I turn on the television. This is in 2021. In 2021, we had no cell phones. The internet was an afterthought. The extent of using the internet was maybe going to a couple of websites to research stuff for a, a term paper, but really your research for a term paper was done at the library. The extent of using the internet for us was probably AIM, email, and, and I'll cut to the chase. We were 19 and 20 years old, probably some porn as well. That's the extent of what we used it for. So we get back to our apartment, natural light wallpaper everywhere, foosball table in the center. We turn on the television and we flip through the channels and every single channel was these, these buildings. And we didn't even know Twin Towers at the time. Now Twin Towers is just like a brand and a name you know. And we're watching in horror as the news is unfolding before us on the television screen. And we realized immediately that, at least over the course of an hour and change that morning, that this was probably not an accident. We leave 456-4. Tom and I head to Phi Kappa Psi. It's the fraternity at the end of Rugby Road. If you're going down Rugby Road, there's one iconic fraternity right in front of the Mad Bull, the huge field on Rugby Road, and that iconic fraternity was Phi Kappa Psi. That was my and Tom's fraternity. Shannon joined as a pledge the following year. I had friends from Williamsburg, Virginia that were a year above me and two years above me that were my gateway into Phi Kappa Psi, this epicenter for partying and meeting people, of course, girls. And we head to Phi Kappa Psi because we're getting to know the brothers there. And one brother who was a year above us, his name is Tom O'Connell. And I remember this like it was yesterday. Tom O'Connell was from the Northeast and his dad worked in Manhattan. And he was unable to reach his dad. He was able to talk to his mom and his mom could not reach his dad. And Tom, in his room, was getting emotional. 
He was scared. He was uncertain. <coughs> he was frightened. He was terrified. Here's a 21-year-old, third year at UVA, sitting on the floor of his fraternity room with three or four of us in his room, and he's curled up like a ball with his back against his bed. His bed was a pull-out futon that also moonlighted as a couch. You'd flip the futon up, and it was a couch. You push the futon down, and it was bed. And he's sitting with his back against the futon. The futon is in bed form, not couch form. And he's sitting there with his knees tight to his chest, his hands and arms wrapped around his knees in a ball. A 21-year-old who's looking to become a man, but is still very much a boy. You know what I mean by that? When you're 21, you're still not yet a man, and you're not a boy. You're in this hybrid stage. And me and Tom... And this other guy, Terry from Connecticut, are in the room. And we're trying to, and this other guy, Mike Cleary, in the room. And we're trying to console Tom O'Connell. And we didn't know anything about consoling anyone. I mean, I was 19. Tom hadn't even turned 19. Mike and Terry were barely 21. So we're putting our arms around Tom O'Connell. We're saying, it's all right, he's gonna show up. It's okay, he's gonna show up. It's all right. It's all right, he's gonna show up. And at that time, all the phone, like Tom's dad had a cell phone. He was either a trader, did something, something in finance. Cell phone towers, all the t towers were down. So his mom couldn't reach him, and he was constantly calling mom looking for dad. I'll never forget this. Tom was one of the lucky ones. His dad survived. Is dad not nearly one of the 3,000 people that died in this terroristic attack? That was my first glimpse of terror. There was the war in Iraq that I remember my dad watching on CNN. CNN was covering the Persian Gulf War, the war in Iraq. I remember that being part of my youth and my childhood in the living room as he would put CNN on and after dinner, before bed, we would follow the news of what was going on. But it seemed so far away that it didn't seem like it impacted us even though U.S. soldiers were there. Now I was 19 in UVA. My parents were not around. I'm seeing a 20, 21 year old in a ball, curled up, anxious, emotional, crying. And I'm knowing that this is happening on American soil. And that was the first time in my life that I truly realized that the world could be an evil, devilish, disturbing place. And some people may hear that statement, you went 19 years and that's the first time you found out the world was evil? And maybe you call it sheltered. And if I was sheltered, then props to my parents for protecting me.
One of the things I watch today is I notice how 9-11 is remembered 22 years later. Here in Charlottesville and in Central Virginia, you're not seeing it as much of a priority as it probably should be. My wife and her family from Long Island, proud New Yorkers. We're gonna watch the New York Jets game and the Buffalo Bills game tonight. My wife is a diehard Jets fan. If you grow up on Long Island, you like the Jets, you like the Mets, you like the Islanders, you like the blue collar teams. <coughs> you don't root for the Yankees, the Rangers, the Giants. Those are the team, the teams of the transplants or the financiers or the wealthy, the Jets, the Islanders, <coughs> the Mets. Those are the team of the blue collar. My wife's parents, a mechanic, a nurse, proud New Yorkers, proud New Yorkers, have the accent, proud to be where they're from. Complain about it, talk about the traffic, talk about the water, talk about the taxes, talk about the cost of living, talk about the politics and how everything's so expensive. Have an issue with that congestion and all the people moving there. But when it comes down to it, that, those complaints and that bitching and moaning is rooted in a sense of pride for where they're from. And I see it. And I've grown to appreciate it over the eight years and change she and I have been together. Proud New Yorkers. You're from New York, you know what I'm talking about. 9-11 in New York, Manhattan, New Jersey, Long Island. It still resonates true. Still powerful. Still conjuring images of murder and death and evil and devil, and terrorists, and sadness, and despair. <coughs> Here in Central Virginia, Charlottesville, Albemarle, Fluvanna, Louisa Green, not so much. Seems like we've almost forgotten, either chosen, choosing to forget, or just the consequence of time, where either time heals or time yields a shorter memory. So I guess I'll take this first portion of the program and say, look, nearly 3,000 people died on American soil because Al-Qaeda and terrorists did a coordinated attack on some of the most densely populated areas of our country. And it's up to us, Americans, now parents, gosh, I'm a parent of two, it's crazy, to make sure that our kids, our sons, your kids, your daughters, your sons, don't forget this. And if the lessons aren't being taught like they should in history class and schools, it's up to us as parents to reinforce these lessons and these memories. Because watching my friend Tom O'Connell in a ball on the third floor a Phi Kappa Psi with his back resting against a futon with me, tall Tom, and tall Terry next to him offering some comfort I'll never forget that. And moms and dads, isn't it such a fine line between protecting and sheltering our kids, our most precious commodities, but also offering them a true glimmer and glimpse into what the world really is? Like, how do we manage that line? And I'm so new to parenting. My wife is so new to parenting. We have a five-and-a-half-year-old and a... Half year old and a nine-month-old. 
we're not pros, we're rookies. We're like in single A baseball right now, nowhere close to the big leagues. How do we manage this fine line of protecting and sheltering our children, but also preparing our children for a world that can be cruel and evil and full of malice and despair. My parents chose to protect me and shelter me either as a Southern Baptist in church, big church, Sunday school on Sunday, Sunday evening dinner, Wednesday night fellowship, youth group, through a Catholic school, Walsingham Academy, and through keeping me busy in sports and limiting my television time. There was a time where kids got one hour of TV a night. We couldn't play video games. We didn't have iPads or cell phones. I was allowed to watch two 30-minute shows a night only after my homework was done. I had to play a sport every single season. Every single season I had to play a sport. I went to church from 10 a.m. to noon on Sundays, and then from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Sundays, I had Wednesday night fellowship where we had dinner and we broke bread with the church Wednesday evenings from 6 to 8 p.m. and was often there on the weekend as well. Then we had Walsingham Academy who legitimately had a religion class every single day. We were sheltered and protected. It wasn't until really sophomore, junior, and senior year that I started really getting into trouble. Certainly college. Such a fine line. Shelter and protect. While still preparing and exposing to what the world could be. Let me talk some news. 9-11. Don't forget do not forget. Don't let our children forget. Please. You know what? Save the UVA sports headline until the end of the show. It seems inconsequential now that UVA is 0-2 on the season. They lose to James Madison University. Tony Elliott, this football team very well could win two games this entire season. If people don't think Tony Elliott's seat is hot in year two, you're not reading the tea leaves correctly. Let's go to a topic that matters right now. Let's talk our schools. Let's talk our children. And let's talk the people that determine the direction our schools are going to go. Tonight, Meg Bryce and Allison Spillman are doing a Q&A in Crozet. I hate the phrase Q&A, question and answer. Makes it sound so inconsequential and marginalizes what's actually happening. Tonight in Crozet, in one room, two people that are polar opposites from each other, Meg Bryce and Allison Spillman, will be introducing themselves to potential voters to Almaro County, in Almaro County. You couldn't find women that are two more different than these two. You got one mom and Bryce who is a mom of four. You got one mom in Spillman who's a mom of five. Okay, there's one similarity. They're mothers and they have kids. That might be their only similarity. They're mothers and they have children. All right, and I'll give you this. They both believe that they have what's best. They know what's best for Almore County Public Schools. So they have three similarities, four similarities. They're women, they're mothers, they have children, and they both believe their approaches are the best for Almaro County Public Schools. That's where it stops. Spillman, well documented. She is... Uh, Choosing my words carefully, Allison. Allison, I've continued to invite you to come on this program. Dr. Bryce is willing to come on the program. Ms. Spillman, if you could come on the program. I, 
can assure you that it would be a very fair interview. And it would be an opportunity for the community to get to know you at a much greater clip and frequency than you've currently positioned yourself in. You again, I'm just gonna talk facts here. You're, you're way behind on the fundraising. I mean, it's not even close. I think she's like three X ahead of you roughly in fundraising. The Bryce signs are everywhere in Almoral County. I mean, Meg Bryce signs are literally everywhere in Almoral County. You can't drive somewhere without seeing Meg Bryce signs. I would say right now at this point of the race, you got to say Bryce is ahead. And you're basing that on fundraising dollars. You're basing that on parental frustration when it comes to the schools, parental frustration when it comes to bus driver shortage, SOL performance, school performance. You're basing that on the signage you see around town. I would not say you're winning this race right now. And if you think the 82 people on Twitter that are socialist Charlottesville are the voting mechanism or the foundation for springing you into office, please consider what happened to, please consider what Amy Lawford did, and please consider what Katrina Carlson did. Those 82 people on Twitter were vehemently opposed to Katrina Carlson. They were very much in favor of Dave Norris. Katrina Carlson pounded Dave Norris, beat him like a drum. I was the delegate race earlier this year. I mean, who was Lawfer's opponent in the race, Judah? Look it up. I mean, Lawfer won the delegate race so in such dominant capacity, I'm legitimately having to Google who Lawfer pounded. Squire. Yeah. Count Squire came on our show, right? Count Squire came on our show. She beat him like a drum. The 82 people on Twitter called Socialist Charlottesville were backing Katrina, were backing Dave Norris, and the 82 people were backing Kellen Squire. I would almost say to you, Ms. Spillman, that having these 82 people in your corner, socialists and activists Charlottesville in your corner, may work against you. Because the community is starting to say, these are the same 82 people that were in favor of BUP zoning. These were the same 82 people that were in favor of defunding the police. These were the same 82 people that gave us the Nakaya Walker regime. The Nakaya Walker regime. These 82 people. I mean, strike one. Strike one, defund the police. Big strike two, Nakaya Walker. And clearly a strike three, upzoning. I mean, is Spillman about to be strike four? That's why I encourage you to come here and explain your platform to those that are interested because there is not a platform of influence that reaches more people than this. And that's a fact. You got Spillman, five kids. She's highlighted this herself. One of them who identifies as transgender. Five kids in public school. Bryce, four kids. Three of them I know in private. Not sure the youngest is old enough yet. You got Spillman, who's behind on the fundraising. Bryce, who's accumulated campaign funds at levels that I've never seen or could possibly fathom for a school board race. Bryce has got so much fundraising money. She's got a war chest. She's got more fundraising dollars than freaking the Board of Supervisors who are running for supervisor. And that's the leg up on the political ladder. <coughs> this school board race is akin to a soap opera. How many moms out there and dads out there are watching the school board race? How many feel more, so emotionally invested in this race? Hit the like button or share the show or leave a comment.
anyone. So many people liking and sharing the show right now. I see you guys. I see you guys. John Blair says, the only other school board election that I can recall with this much controversy was the 2003 Whitehall District matchup between David Wyant and Eric Strucco. 2003, 20 years ago. John Blair also says, UVA class of 2000 here. So he's four years ahead of me. He was 2003 law school, John Blair. He says, Lambeth was truly legendary during that time. A true story about Lambeth in 1998. UVA played North Carolina in football that year at Scott Stadium. I went to the game with my girlfriend. We went to Little John's after the game and then walked back to Lambeth around 9.30 at night. As you remember, UVA kids used to go crazy after football wins. We get back and we're walking to her building and there is literally a guy being held over the railing of the top floor staircase by his legs. He's hanging over the railing and drinking a fratty light while about 30 students were screaming their heads off in joy. As you stayed, Jerry, it was a different time. It was a different time. We used to buzz cut our hairs at the top level of Lambeth, John, like give each other haircuts and just let the remnants of the hair fall to the ground on the apartment in front of the door on the bottom level of us. And then these students would come out of their ground floor apartment and there would be six people's buzz cut hair as they entered or exited their door right there. It was disgusting, deplorable behavior, I know. We used to throw eggs from the top level of Lambeth across Lambeth Commons to the other apartments and pelt the windows with eggs. Each of us would have two eggs in hand. All six of us would come out on the landing and we'd rip eggs at windows across the way and then sprint into our apartments, turn the lights off and look out the windows as those kids and those students in those apartments went out and looked and said, what the hell happened? Terrible, I know. We are T minus 55, 56 days from the November. Let me get, make sure my day is right. November 7th election. Doesn't early voting start on the 22nd? Is that when early voting starts, viewers and listeners? Deep Throat says, do you think Spillman actually wants to be known to explain a real program? Deep Throat says, I think she's just relying on screaming Bryce's maiden name over and over again in hopes that there are enough zombies of MBC, MSNBC variety in Almore County to put her over the line. We need as much transparency with this race as possible. And I hate to tell you this, but streaming anything on a TV station like NBC 29 is going to be meaningless. The legacy media is not what it used to be. I covered this last week. There's a $50 paywall to access news on the newspaper website. No one's doing that. And the paper's being delivered late through the United States Postal Service. I listen to either CNBC in my car through streaming the actual, what's on air, I stream CNBC through my CNBC app, or I listen to podcasts and Spotify. Don't listen to the radio. And I could not tell you the last time I've watched local television. Kate Sharp's watching the program. She's the queen of Ivy. She put her hand in the air and she says, you know I do. You know I care about this race. 
and I have never cared or watched before COVID times. Now I'm very invested. Sarah Hill Buczynski says the Crozet Gazette is recording the town hall. Recording, the key word there. Carly Wagner says, parents are fed up with their kids being used as political pawns. They want politics out and they want to return to the basics of education, please. Carly Wagner says, I don't have kids in the public schools because the public schools would not be a good fit for them. That said, I wish I could send them to public school. Moreover, I see the problem with failing public schools and know the importance of well-educated populace. If kids can't read, society's future is really bleak. We all have interest in having top quality education and access to it for all. When the only educational option for 90% of the kids is failing, we need to act and we need to act now. Carly Wagner, you've become a valuable member of our listening and viewing audience. And I cannot wait to introduce you to the community when you come on Real Talk on Wednesday, September 27th. It's going to be a fantastic interview. Vanessa Parkhill in Earliesville says, I encourage those kids, I encourage those who do not have kids in school right now to remember these kids will become our doctors, police, lawyers, and electricians of the future. The school board race should matter to all of us because these children deserve the best academic experience our community can offer. I, there's probably somewhere between 60 and 70 comments on all these Facebook pages right now social media channels that we're live streaming on that I cannot get to. We're aggregating comments from podcasting platforms, social media platforms, streaming platforms, all onto one page. And the, I mean, look at this. Another indication that people care. This is what I do know as a parent. <clears throat> and Ginny Hu, you said this best. Ginny Hu is watching on Twitter. She says, choosing what your children are exposed to is not sheltering. It is nurturing young hearts until their minds, souls, and bodies are ready to tackle adult situations in a responsible way. That's Ginny Hu. Ginny Hu said, William and Mary still had classes for doctoral students. I did not go. I commuted from Charlottesville. Who wanted to be right by Camp Perry when no one had a clue what was going on? Ginny Hu, excellent stuff. Ginny Hu on Twitter is agreeing with Carly on one of the 15 Facebook pages this show is streaming on. Ginny Hu says, I agree with Carly. Rather than bashing those of us who do not use the system, Socialist Charlottesville should be interested in why we still want successful public schools for others. I'm going to quote retweet this. One of your best tweets yet. Ginny who put this on my radar first. No one should encourage children to keep secrets from parents. And she mentioned that in relation to empowering students to be able to go to school and either say or read, or identify, or experience something that they're not saying, or reading, or identifying, or experiencing in the household in front of their parents. Until children are out of the household, their parents should be the number one shot callers in what their children choose to do. Now, of course, there are exceptions to that. If parents are malice, have addiction issues, any kind of violence issues, those circumstances are changed. But if those elements do not exist, a child first speaks, conversates, identifies, talks with their parents first, even before their teachers. You don't keep secrets from parents, especially in impressionable times, teenage years.
We'll follow this race. We'll offer some perspective after tonight on this talk show. And all we want to do on this program is to be the water cooler of your ideas and of local news. We'll originate some of the news ourselves. Some of the news like Millie Joe's is for sale. If you want to put that lower third on screen, Millie Joe's coffee shop is for sale. $150,000 asking price. If you're interested in buying Millie Joe's, touring Millie Joe's, checking out the financials, reach out to me. $150,000 asking price for Millie Joe coffee shop. <coughs> if you're interested in bringing your business to market, and in this difficult financial period, you can't find financing through a traditional lender, we understand. We've heard it for 15 years. And for 15 years, we've been helping businesses come to market through branding, through advertising, through finding them financing, through offering them office space in our building. We have 29 office rentals now at our fingertips that I own and can rent. 29 of them. If you don't need an executive office and you're looking for commercial space, we know all the landlords. They either listen to this show or they're a part of the landlord group that meets once a quarter, sometimes in this building. We're doing it with four businesses right now. Four businesses literally right now. We are taking them to market with financing, with commercial lending, with private lending, with attorney, CPA, architect, remodeling recommendations, and by building their brand and soon by promoting their brand. Negotiating the lease. News like I can show you like 1215 Cherry Avenue. Show the photos on screen. Jim Duncan's listing. 1215 Cherry Avenue. Who would have ever thought a home on Cherry Avenue, are they on screen? Look at the screen, look at the screen now. Two bedrooms, one bathroom, 1,037 square feet. It's pending at $385,000. Who in their right mind would have ever thought a home literally on Cherry Avenue would have gone pending in 11 days a home built in 1946. Judah, this home is 77 years old. Mm -hmm. This home that Judah is showing is 77 years old. It has two bedrooms. It has one bathroom, 1,037 square feet. Its lot is minuscule, 8,276 8 square foot lot. When they don't put the lot in acreage, it's a post stamp. Jim Duncan's listing. Props to Duncan of Nest Realty to get this under contract. Duncan's a pro's pro. <coughs> Yet another example that a starter home in the city of Charlottesville is going to cost you three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand dollars. And how about the statistic that I shared on, shared on uh, Twitter and on Instagram and on Facebook over the weekend? How about these two stats for you? Student loan payments are set to resume in October for the first time since 2020. There are now a total of 45 million people in the United States with student loans and $1.6 trillion, trillion with a T, of student loans outstanding. The average monthly student loan payment is 200 bucks a month, J-Dubs. This means roughly $9 billion with a B in consumer spending will be subtracted every month and allocated to student loan payments. Roughly $100 billion per year will be subtracted from consumer spending, mainly with an impact on younger consumers. We're literally going to have a massive shift in consumer spending as people with student loan debt have to start making these payments again, shifting that money from otherwise retail, food and beverage, music, travel, or other kinds of spending. That's going to have a massive impact. And you want to hear another massive impact, viewers and listeners? Get ready for this one. This is a real estate, real estate macro trend for you. 
Real estate markets are about to do something they have not done since 2005. Get ready for this, Judah. Get ready for this, Sarah Hill Buchensky. Get ready for this, Kate Charts, Albert Graves, Vanessa Parkhill, Carly Wagner, Neil Williamson. Get ready for this. I literally have two newspapers watching us on the talk show right now. Bob Shada, Stacey Patty, Logan Wells Clalo, Olivia Branch, Carrie Agnos, Catherine Lochner, Ray Cadell, get ready for what I'm about to say. John Blair, Stephanie Rhodes, get ready for what I'm about to say here. Ginny Hu, get ready. Dylan's Rule, get ready. Real estate markets are about to do something they have not done since 2005. For the first time since the financial crisis, existing home prices are about to pass new home prices. The median new home sales price is now down to $416,000. Meanwhile, the median existing home sales price is up to $396,000. Existing home prices are on track to pass new home prices by December. No one wants to sell their home and lose their 3% mortgage. When old sells more than new, then the system is broken. Deep Throat's got a comment on that. When he comments, I read it. The existing versus new home price spread is going inverted. Stands to reason. Regular homes, Deep Throat says, regular homeowners can't afford to sell. They can't lose the sweet mortgage rate. Home builders can't afford not to sell because they can't carry inventory along at these floating interest rates. The system is effed. Did you hear that, Judah? Mm-hmm. If you own a house, why would you give up a 4% or less mortgage? Over 80, more than 80% of Americans who are homeowners have a mortgage rate of 4% or less. More than 80%, eight zero. They ain't selling their houses. They ain't listing their houses. The people that build houses, the developers and the custom home builders, they can't carry these homes because they have floating debt, debt tied to prime. And because they have floating debt and debt tied to prime, they're doing anything possible to move their homes. <coughs> they're buying down points. They're giving people basement finishes. They're hooking people up just to take the houses off their balance sheets. In December of this year, new home prices, new homes will sell less than existing homes. Think about that. That's like saying, Judah, a new car will sell less than an old car or a used car. Yeah. I want you to think about that. If you want an analogy, a brand new car would sell for a lower price than a used car. That's what's about to happen to housing in December of this year. In America, in 2023, you have housing prices at an all-time high for America. In America, in 2023, you have home equity at an all-time high in American history. In America, in 2023, you have credit card debt at an all-time high in American history. In America, in 2023, you're going to have student loan payments starting up for the first time in three years, removing $100 billion with a B in spending power over the course of a year from Americans. In America, in 2023, you have interest rates at levels we haven't seen since what? 2008, 2009? That's not even right. Look up the last time we've seen interest rates this high. I think it's been a quarter of a century or more. Eighty-one. The annual average was sixteen sixty-three. When's the last time it was this high? We're at seven point six. Thirty-year fixed, decent credit. 
I looked at the 30-year fix this morning. 7.6 this morning. When was the last time it was 7.6? You got a lot of weird stuff going on right now. You know what the hell, what, what scares the bejeebus out of me? You got a presidential election next year. And you got arguably the most polarizing president since when? Ever? Atop the GOP ticket in Trump. And I'm not making this a Trump, an anti or a pro Trump thing. But I think anyone could say one of the most polarizing men in the history of America is Donald Trump. And right now he's looking like your front runner for the GOP. You find that number? Deep throw coming through clutch. I said it 25 years, 2000, 23 years, he says. You have to go back to 2000 since we've had interest rates like this high. <coughs> so not only are home prices the most expensive they've ever been, interest rates are at a 23-year high. Equity is at an all-time country high. Credit card debt is an all-time country high. Inventory is at one of the lowest it's ever been. And you got a presidential race this time next year. You don't think the Democrats and the Republicans are going to try to leverage those elements that I just outlined to their political advantage over the next 12 months? You're huffing glue out of a Ziploc bag. Puts in perspective for me, Judah, talking about UVA and JMU. And to talk UVA and JMU, because I, I bleed orange and blue, and I encourage you to watch the Jerry and Jerry show tomorrow at 10.15 a.m. Virginia football, maybe the only positive from Saturday's game is Anthony Calandria. Calandria, Calandria might be the only thing positive that came out of that football game. You may have a quarterback here. Outside of that, I don't even think you have a head coach. And you have to genuinely ask yourself, if this team wins two games, and it won three games last year, and if he wins five games in two years, what are the natives and the alumni and the fans going to do? And I'll leave it at that. You want to add anything? <coughs> no. It's a Monday. Watch the Spillman Bryce Q&A this evening in Crozet. And Allison, come on the show. You know what? I'll send her a DM right now. I'll send her a DM literally live on air. I don't get it. I, you ha my word is my bond. If anyone watches this program, they, how do you think I get this information? Ms. Spillman, Judah, you can confirm what I'm about to write because you can see my DMs here on Facebook. We kindly invite you on the I Love Seville show to spotlight your platform and campaign. Are you looking at my DMs right now on Facebook? Please join us. In fact, if you would like, we can host you in a one-on-one -on -one setting where it is just you and me. We do not need to do a debate to start. We can save that for later if you are up for it. Thank you kindly. 
Did you see what I just sent? Yeah. You confirm I just sent that to her, right? Yep. Thank you. Voters deserve to know who Bryce and Spillman are. Our future is at stake. And just like I led the program, where it's us as parents, we better continue to teach <coughs> the impact of 9-11 to our children and what happened so they don't forget. <coughs> we also should follow this race <coughs> closely because our children and their education and their future depends on it. For Judah Wickhauer, I'm Jerry Miller, and this is the I Love Sebo Show on a Monday. So long, everybody.